Hey guys, Danny Johnson here, and today we're going to be learning about dynamometers, or also as they're called in short, dynos. So basically what a dyno is, is it's a way to help you measure your horsepower and torque output of your engine uh, by basically rolling the car up onto some rollers and uh, it's, you're basically going to spin this big 3,000 pound drum uh, and uh, by that they're going to calculate how much horsepower and torque your car is making. There's other forms of dynos, we'll get into that a little bit later, but the general principle is you're basically having the wheels push this big mass and uh, it's going to calculate how much power the car makes by doing so. Uh, with that said, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the corrections that happen with dynos. We're going to talk about the different kinds of dynos. I'm going to talk about an article I read that I really liked about uh, when Hot Rod Magazine went out and tested five different dynos in their area to see how precise they were and what they found. And we'll also go over the um, dyno that uh, runs that this car had made before I bought it and uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, the first thing to know is that you're going to see a lot lower of a number on the dyno than what the car, horse, the car is producing at the crankshaft. And the reason why is because you have parasitic loss from the engine through the transmission, through the drive, tra drive shaft and the axles and all that. They even talk about the IRS cars having a little bit more parasitic loss. And so basically uh, what you're going to see on your readout is going to be about 15 to 20% lower than what the car's engine is actually uh, putting out. So you want to keep in mind that they also call the dyno the heartbreaker because you're going to be all excited about how much power you're going to make and you're going to open this up and be like, oh, that's, you know, you're going to see a lower number. So you have to understand that a dyno is a tool. It's used for tuning the car. It's going to help you know if there's a problem with the car if you do back-to-back -back runs and you know see a, a big drop or if the car starts breaking up and that kind of thing. And also know that the car is going to run a lot different on the street than on the dyno. Uh, we'll talk about this, but you, you know when you get to the dyno, you're going to pop the hood and put big fans to simulate airflow through the radiator and keep the car cool. And on a turbo car, uh, it's going to spool a lot differently on a dyno than it would on the street. So. Just keep in mind that a dyno is a tool used for helping you get a good tune on the car, um, but it's not everything. Okay, The horsepower printout that it'll give you, you'll find that different dynos are going to tell you different things. And um, you know if that's the most important thing to you, then you better find the dyno that's going to give you the biggest readout. But um, other than that, the most important thing is that at the end of the day, you have a safe tune on your car and uh, you use it as a tool. Um, for uh, for tuning the car. So uh, I found a website, it's called uh, Dynamite Dynometers, and basically um, it's gonna give us a good exp explanation um, about the corrections that you see on a dyno. Uh, what you'll find is that in the software of the dynos, they can program the humidity, the temperature, the elevation, and all these factors and that's gonna change the entire output of, of your results. In fact, uh, the magazine article rec um, starts to mention that they did a, a baseline test at sea level and then in the computer they added in that they were up at 6,000 feet elevation and it gave the car 150 horsepower more. So that can tell you right there how these numbers could so easily be skewed and uh, you know just how changing a few parameters in the dyno can give you some different readings and so you can find that some people want you to be happy when you leave the dyno so they're going to give you a better readout some people don't care they know that you're there to get a, a proper tune on the car and they're going to give it to you straight so okay so i found this really good uh, d definition about correction for horsepower which is on dynamite 
And uh, basically, it's going to be talking about some of these corrections that are made, uh, you know, with the dinos according to elevation and humidity and that kind of thing. So I wanted to read this, this part of it. Uh, it was written pretty well. It says, We have all seen and made claims of an engine's horsepower. However, the stated horsepower is almost never what the engine actually made for power. How can this be? Most of the stated horsepower numbers are corrected values. The correction standards were developed to discount the observed horsepower readings taken at different locations and weather conditions. It is obvious that an engine's builder in Colorado could not produce as much horsepower as a shop at sea level. There is just less oxygen for the engine to burn at a higher altitude. What are less obvious are the weather uh, condition effects on the engine. So in order to compensate for all of an advertised horsepower, is corrected several different in, by several different industrial uh, standards. Most of you know about atmospheric correction factors that are used to compare an engine's power output for one day or location to another. However, these factors can be rather confusing and even deceptive. Everybody seems to declare there's an, their engine's horsepower as etched in stone. However, we also know that the engine will make very different power on different days, including or excluding other factors like engine temperature and quality of fuel used. The engine output is very dependent on the amount of oxygen in the air. So the only way to compare an engine's horsepower is to correct the output on a given day by some standard. The most common are SAE standards. The older J607 standard considered that the engine was run at 60 degrees Fahrenheit with 0% humidity and barometric pressure of 29.92, or the newer SAE J1349 standard of 77 degrees Fahrenheit with 0% humidity and barometric pressure of 29.23. Also, the ECE standard is the same as the SAE J1349, but does not use mechanical efficiency in the equations. The DIN standard, which corrects to 68 degrees Fahrenheit day with 0% humidity and barometric pressure of 29.92, and JIS standard corrects at 77 degrees Fahrenheit with 0% humidity and a barometric pressure 29.23, but uses different correction curves than that of the other. Further, we have the J1995, corrects 77 degrees Fahrenheit with 0% humidity and barometric pressure 29.53. So as you can see, all these different standards are correcting for different uh, base temperatures, and as you know, a, a colder temperature, there's more dense air, more oxygen in the air, and you're going to make more horsepower. So you'll see a, a whole wave of different uh, standards for this. So. Uh, the point with this is whatever dyno you end up going to, you want to ask them some of these questions and say, you know, what what correction standard are we using? Uh, what's the percentage and, and that kind of thing. So uh, now we're going to jump over to this, uh, this magazine article that I really enjoyed reading in Hot Rod Magazine. This was March 1st, 2001. And they basically went out and they took a brand new at the time Super Snake GT500 that was supposed to make uh, 750 horsepower and so they went to five different dynos and they told them they told each of the people at the dyno oh this is our dad's car he just wants a baseline he wants to know how much it's really putting down and uh, it was very interesting the difference in all the five different dynos that they used so the first one they went to was a dyno jet now dyno jets one of the inertia dynos where you roll the car up onto a lift and you put the wheels on the rollers and uh, so as they started spinning it, um, basically this car, they, okay, well they were keeping track of everything. They made sure that the hood was up and at all the dynos they had a fan blowing on it. In this particular setup they had one fan blowing on the car, they had the hood up and it was like a 45 minute drive out there. The car cooled for about an hour so they figured it was pretty good. So the car put down 651 horsepower and 611 SAE STD horse horsepower and torque okay and they looked and the correction it was using was the 1.02 percent correction okay then uh, they went for a 10 minute cool down and made another run so it made virtually the same power back to back now that 656 horsepower 611 torque and then they were offered you know that the guy said that for a thousand dollars plus the cost of a tuner 
I can put a tune on this and get you another 50 horsepower, and they, they declined that offer. So then they went to the second uh, dyno, and this was a Mustang dyno. Now, Mustang dynos uh, are known to be the heartbreaker because these ones typically read a little bit lower. And so uh, their final results on this one, uh, they lost 87 horsepower and they gained 15 pound-feet of torque. And uh, on that first run, they, they wanted to know why, and so they actually called the manufacturer and found out that a filter had been left on from previous. Um, and that had affected some of, and skewed some of the numbers. So then they uh, they gave it another run. Uh, let's see, and this is where they had put in just for fun the altitude difference of it being 6,000 feet above sea level and gained 150 horsepower, just to kind of show how easily numbers could be skewed. Um, but uh, basically, this one. It did read a lot lower, uh, which Mustang dynos typically do. It's just part of their software. Okay, so then they drove over to another dyno jet, and they were hoping to see similar numbers as the first dyno jet, uh, which is a, a brand of dyno. And um, so they did um, the first pull that they made, the tires or the clutch had slipped one or the other. They didn't know, so they had a bad run. So they let it cool down a minute, took it for another uh, run, and it made more power every time they were dyno dynoing it, like three or four times in a row. And so the uh, operator's claim was that the computer was learning the car, and this was the first time it had been run hard. And they said that couldn't be because they had beaten the heck out of it driving it over there. And, uh, you know, it had already been on the dyno before. So a point we want to make here as well is, um, you know, the person operating the dyno, their job is to operate the dyno. And a lot of people expect them to be experts on cars and to know everything that's going wrong with the car and diagnose the car. And, you know, they always have a lot of questions to answer. So don't take it too hard on, on the person who's actually operating the dyno. Okay. Um, so anyway, um, they, they, on this one, they actually had two fans blowing on the car. The hood was up, kind of the same thing. And uh, it made 564 horsepower, okay, which was a lot lower. But then it all of a sudden just started jumping back up to where it was. So 564 horsepower, 553, then 664. So it's seen this huge jump. And once again, operators saying, oh, it must be the car computer learning or something like that. So anyway, they drove to the next dyno, which was a dyno pack. Now, this is one where you'll actually remove the wheels off of the car and the machine mounts up to the actual like wheel hubs. And this is where you get the term brake horsepower. And you'll see that a lot, uh, especially if you watch a lot of Top Gear and some of the other England type, you know, United Kingdom kind of stuff. They love referring it to it as brake horsepower. And the reason why is because these other dynos, the first dyno is called an inertia dyno. So you're putting the you're putting the car on these big rollers that the wheels are spinning, these a big drum that weighs about 3,000 pounds. Okay, on this other form, it's um, Basically, they call it brake horsepower because as the wheels are turning, it's turning water. This is like a hydraulic, or it can even be electric, depending on the setup. But it's turning, basically, these big shafts on one end where the wheels are. And then on the machine itself, it's pushing water and turning the water. Now, that water pressure, there's a little a gauge inside, and it's measuring how much pressure it would take basically to counter the, the pressure that's being moved. And so in a way it's kind of like saying that the machine itself is measuring how much force it would take to stop or to break the dyno. You know, so basically if it was, if your car was putting down 500 foot pounds of torque, it's calculating it would need 500 foot pounds of braking force to stop that. Okay, so that's why they call it brake horsepower. And that's what this dyno was. Okay, so they removed the wheels on this one. It was cheaper to dyno this one over there. Um, they were getting similar torque at, as the last shop, um, but uh, way different horsepower. And on this one, it, it was kind of going the opposite direction. It started losing horsepower. It went from 602 horsepower down to 580, down to 561. So um, they... Anyway, they took their results there and they moved on to the, the last uh, dyno, which was a Superflow 
um, Autodyne 30. And this is the inertia. Um, this one could be either inertia or eddy current mode. And the eddy current mode is kind of what we're talking about, the electric version using the brake horsepower kind of method. Uh, this one was built into the floor, so they drove the car just straight into the building. You've probably seen those kind of dynos too. And they did the hot lap tech, uh, technique, which I kind of agree with the most. They're running the car back to back, and that's going to simulate real world driving. Because if you do a dyno pull, and then you stop and let the car cool down, then you do another dyno pull, and then you stop and let it cool down, you're not really simulating what the engine's really going to see as it's driving around the whole time. Uh, you know, it's not like you pull over off of the freeway and sit down and wait for 10 minutes and then start driving again. You know, so I kind of like that method better. And uh, they were thinking it was probably heat soak as the supercharger was getting hotter and hotter and hotter that they were losing some horsepower. So it declined from 624 uh, horsepower down to 632. Then they let it sit a little bit and it went back up to 638 and 624. So uh, the conclusion is basically... If you set aside these huge hero runs where the car just makes a, a huge amount of power, uh, you can really monitor what the car is really doing. Some of the techniques mentioned that you want to be careful of are your tire pressure can affect your readout, so you want it to be consistent. And the main thing on this is not trying to cheat the dyno so that you get the biggest number, but you want to have all of these things the same every time you go to dyno the car. Dyno it at the same place. Use the same person behind the dyno, you know, just make sure that everything's consistent so that you know if your car's actually gaining or losing horsepower, and it'll, it'll let you know. So tire pressure, how tight the car's strapped down, make sure your hood's open the entire time. Uh, you operate, same operator driving the car, uh, the same amount of fans, same data, like we were saying on the correction, and weather correction, so those corrections can range from 0.9 to 1.09. That's kind of the normal range for it. Um, and then make sure they're use, putting in the same altitude, same. And sometimes they're using, you know, power versus RPM. Sometimes it's engine speed, uh, you know, that they're using to get their numbers. But uh, for the most part, they'll have that set up kind of the same way uh, just for the dyno itself. But you might want to ask them, you know, is everything the same with the dyno from the last time I was here? You know, that kind of thing. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, um, as I did earlier, is, you know, once you get the piece of paper, you might be a little bit heartbroken when you see the readout and you're like, oh, I was expecting a little more power. But uh, just remember that the car is going to make about 15% less horsepower at the wheels, even 15 to 20, really, uh, than what the engine's making. And I was quite upset and lost some respect for Top Gear. I'll show you a picture here. Um, Basically what they did is they were testing the GT500 when it came out in like 2007 and uh, they're driving it around, they're ripping on it for having a solid rear axle and not having magnetic dampening on the shocks and you know it's an American car, this kind of crap. But the part I didn't like is they put it up onto a dyno and when they run it, um, it comes out to 447 horsepower and so uh, he goes over to the side with like a sharpie and it says GT500 and he writes almost next to 500. Well, first of all, that's not why they call it a GT500. Second of all, um, he should know, especially with how much they do with cars, that 447 horsepower is like 514 horsepower. So it actually was making 500 horsepower. So it just kind of shows how stupid they were doing that and just trying to, to rip on the American cars. But anyway, that's the same thing that you're going to get from people. And you're going to have both sides with people saying, how much did it put down to the ground? And you're like, oh, you know, five, 550 or, or whatever. And they're going to be like, oh, so it's not 600 horsepower. And you're like, yeah, it is. You know, or you're going to say, how much, is your horse, how much horsepower does your car make? And if you calculate it in, go, let's see, 590 times 15 horsepower. Yeah, it's about 670 horsepower. They're going to be like, not at the tires. And it's like, well, yeah, in order to make 590 at the tires, you have to make 670 at the crank. So anyway, just just be aware that um, in the car world, it seems like people are ridiculed for their dyno numbers no matter what they do. So um, anyway, I was going to show you here some of the readouts that this car has seen. Uh, I thought this one was pretty cool. 
And I had uh, read that the horsepower and the torque curve will always cross at like 5225 RPM. And you can kind of see that had happened here. So I thought that was interesting. I didn't know if that was just for a specific car, but it looks like that uh, it always does that. So uh, this was for this Cobra here when all it had was a cat back uh, put on it, uh, intake and cat back. And so this one, for example, made 406 horsepower on its first run and 390 torque. And then uh, that was kind of the baseline. And then from there, it went up a bit to 414 horsepower and 391 pound-feet of torque. Uh, so that was kind of neat. That was just when all it had was, you know, a cat back and an intake on it. And uh, this one, let's see, this one was on a Dynojet Model 248C. And that's about all the information that this one really gave us. And it says SAE corrected horsepower there on the side, but it doesn't really tell us on this sheet uh, what those corrections were. Uh, this is the most recent one where it has the 2.3 liter Whipple on it. And uh, interestingly enough, it shows only a horsepower readout, but it, it does mention the torque, but it doesn't have it drawn out like this other one did. So um, the good thing about these supercharged cars is you see the torque reading is flat. You know that's it's already straight there where the horsepower has to climb up. So that's the that's the good part about having a positive displacement supercharged car. It's just instant torque. Anyhow, um, so this one uh, shows that it made 589.6 horsepower and 556 pound-feet of torque. Down here at the bottom, it shows the uh, air fuel ratio, which is pretty cool. And it showed that it was uh, dropping down lower than 11, and uh, that's where you want it. However, um, when I put the wideband on this car, it was pegging 9.9. .9. And if you look at the, uh, the wideband, when they go to dyno a car like this, you'll see them put the little O2, the wideband sensor, in the tailpipe at the very end. So it's going to actually, by the time the exhaust gets all the way back there, it's going to be different. It's going to be probably more conservative than where your wideband is put on your exhaust, you know, 12 inches from the manifold. Uh, so I'm pegging 9.9, .9 and I also did remove the cat's sense, so it's running a little more rich. Um, but uh, anyway, it's a little more rich than this says. Uh, this one says that it was giving uh, the following... Um, it was 86 degrees Fahrenheit, 27 uh, on the barometric pressure, and humidity 4%, STD correction 1.08. So um, that's basically the numbers that we got on this one. And um, like I said, if you, and this one also I believe was on a Dynojet. Uh, just from, yeah, Dynojet research. So just remember, you know, the numbers that are you know that you see on here aren't always you know exactly set in stone you you could take this to three different dynos and get three different numbers just like the article said so uh, the most important thing is that you're getting the car tuned safely and you know getting it ready for the track and you can even do more tuning afterwards with the car on the ground uh, running through the gears and uh, and that kind of thing so anyway I hope I covered everything pretty well for you today um, if you have questions, I'll do my best to answer them if you put them in the comments. But just remember in general that a dyno is a tool just to help measure the car's performance and output. It's used to help you tune the car properly so you don't blow it up. <laughs> and uh, you know, don't take the numbers too seriously. And um, also just know it's called the heartbreaker because you know, these numbers might not be exactly what you're looking for. Or maybe they are. You know, I'm, I'm happy with what this car put down. It's healthy. Uh, it did what it's supposed to. Um, but uh, you just have to keep in mind that you're going to have about a 15 to 20 percent loss from the engine when it finally makes its way back to the wheels. And uh, just remember, you have these different kinds of dynos. Some are inertia, where you're turning a big drum and it's measuring how it, you know how much time it takes to go from 2,000 to 6,000 RPM, pushing 3,000 pounds. And then you have the other one for brake horsepower, where it's measuring how much horsepower and torque it would take to stop or to break uh, you know that current output so uh, when you watch all these other videos like Top Gear and they say this car is making this much brake horsepower it's all the same thing when the when the when the rating comes from the manufacturer it's from the engine and then when you actually have 
you know, this printout, this is at the wheels. And so, you know, feel free to add another 15% minimum back into these numbers to know how much horsepower your engine's most likely developing. And, uh, you know, just, uh, just enjoy the whole thing because, you know, this is the fun part about cars is different ways of measuring what they're doing and, and having fun with it. So. Anyway, thanks for watching, guys. Hope you enjoyed.